What's up, guys? So I just got off a long stretch of seven days on in a row in the emergency room. And something that I like to do every single day that I get off a shift is to replay every single patient that I saw back in my mind. So with each patient, I ask myself, is there anything that I could have done better? Are there any gaps in my knowledge on certain disease processes? And was I able to make a positive impact in this patient's life? So if I identify that I could have done something better, then I take a note. And the next time I see a patient with a similar problem, I'm ensuring that I provide the best medical care possible. And if I identify that there's any gaps in my knowledge, I read extensively on a topic, consult with my attending physicians, my physician assistants, nurse practitioners, and I do a type of mini case review. However, this week, there wasn't much that I thought I could do better, and I didn't find that I had too many gaps in my knowledge, but looking back, I felt like I was really able to make a positive impact in the lives of my patients. Now, working in emergency medicine, we often feel like we're making the biggest impact when we're working on a code and we're able to bring somebody back, or when we're taking care of that crashing patient and we're able to stabilize them, make an accurate diagnosis, improve their clinical condition, and then admit them for further care. Well, this week, I was reminded that every single time you see a patient Irregardless of how non-emergent their complaint is, you have the opportunity to drastically improve the quality of their life. So with that said, today I want to speak about my most interesting and my most fulfilling cases of last week. So starting off from the beginning of the week, I saw a 34-year-old male who presented with chest pain. It had been going on for approximately 12 hours and it started shortly after he'd been snorting multiple doses of cocaine. By the time he presented to the emergency room and he saw me, he said that his chest pain was actually doing better, it was resolving, and he was feeling better. His EKG had shown signs of left ventricular hypertrophy and it had some secondary nonspecific repolarization abnormalities. However, his labs, his chest x-ray, his cardiac enzymes, and a repeat EKG all came back within normal limits and they were all non-suggestive of an acute coronary syndrome. So I went back into the room to speak with him. But when I did, this time I brought his EKG in with me. And I told him that his workup was not suggested that he was having a heart attack, but that his lifestyle choices of tobacco abuse, marijuana abuse, cocaine abuse, along with his family history of heart disease, place him at a higher risk of having an acute coronary event in the future. I then proceeded to show him his EKG and I educated him a little bit that his long-term cocaine abuse has caused his heart to work harder over the past 10 years, which subsequently had resulted in left ventricular hypertrophy. Now, up until this point, I wasn't really sure that anything that I had said actually gotten through to him or maybe even influenced his decision going forward. But as he was looking at his own EKG, he began crying. And I asked him very sincerely, what's wrong? Are you okay? And as he was sobbing, he said, yeah, I'm, I'm just ashamed. I'm ashamed of my behavior and what I'm doing to my body and what I'm doing to my family. So I paused for a moment, not really knowing exactly what to say. And I put my hand on his shoulder and I told him that this was his moment to remember this feeling right now and that it took him great courage to admit to me his behaviors. And as he was still crying, he looked up, he shook my hand and he said, thank you for caring for me. I gave him an uh, addiction specialist to follow up with and what started out as a routine chest pain just a simple chest pain rule out um, ended up possibly changing his life. Now, I think back to this case and it reminds me that not only is it important to provide quality care, but it's also just important to provide quality, passionate care. We need to be compassionate and understanding when we're treating patients. So I really, I really like looking back at this and it reminds me just to always care for the patient and look forward um, to taking care of patients and treating them in their best interest. So my next interesting case I saw 
um, was a 55-year-old female who'd been seen earlier in the week in my emergency room, and she had complaints of a cough. Her initial chest x-ray showed a right perihylar infiltrate, and her initial workup was suggestive of pneumonia. She was started on antibiotics that day, and she was sent home. Well, she came back to the ER, and when she represented, she wasn't getting any better. I did a repeat chest x-ray, and it showed the same right perihylar infiltrate. Um, so then I um, was concerned, maybe treatment failure, resistance to her antibiotics. But then I ordered a CTA of the chest, which showed no evidence of a pulmonary embolus. But what it did show was a 17 millimeter pulmonary nodule in her right perihylar region that was being mistaken for a right perihylar infiltrate, which given her smoking history was very concerning to me because I knew that any pulmonary nodule greater than 20 millimeters or more have greater than a 50% chance of being malignant. So while she was stable enough to get a further workup as an outpatient, after voicing my concern to the hospitalist that in the event that it was a small cell carcinoma, which if you remember that most small cell carcinomas and squamous cell carcinomas present with central masses or central nodules, and if you remember more specifically about small cell carcinoma, you should expect metastasis at the initial diagnosis. So in the event that this was small cell carcinoma of the lung, then it could progress very, very rapidly. And I spoke with my hospitalist about that and voiced my concern, and he agreed, let's admit this patient and let's speed up this workup. So ultimately, she was found to have small cell carcinoma of the lung. But looking back at this case, I was so glad that we are able to speed up this diagnosis, and I have to think that maybe this early diagnosis might have made a significant difference in this patient's treatment outcome, because to my knowledge, they did not identify any sites of metastasis and just regional lymphadenopathy. So when I think about this case, once again, it reminds me how important it is to advocate for our patients and do things in their best interest at all times. My last two interesting cases of the week stemmed from incidental findings on exam. The first patient I saw was a 58-year-old male who presented with complaints of shortness of breath. He said that he had progressively been getting short of breath over the past couple of weeks, and it was worse with walking on physical exam of his oropharynx, which I really only was looking at his physical exam to see how dry his tongue was it revealed his first abnormal finding. I noticed that his uvula was pulsating, and I literally had him open his mouth for a good 30 seconds, just staring at his uvula, and it kept pulsating again and again and again. Then I went on to do the rest of his physical exam, which ultimately was pretty unrevealing to the cause of his shortness of breath, but when I listened to his heart, I heard a diastolic blowing murmur loudest at the right upper sternal border, which sounded like aortic regurgitation. I then looked up the significance of this systolic pulsating uvula on exam, and I identified it to be Mueller's sign. And although this is very, very rare, it's seen in patients with long-standing aortic regurgitation due to the wide pulse pressure. So this patient was then admitted to cardiology, I have not yet followed up on his plan of treatment, but I wanted to share this case because not only is it very rare, but because it reminds me the importance of doing a good physical exam on every single patient that you see. Which brings me to my last interesting case of the week. I had a 24-year-old female who was a G2 P1, and she was approximately five weeks and three days pregnant. She had been seen in our hospital three days prior complaining of vaginal bleeding and lower abdominal pain. Her workup at that time confirmed an intrauterine pregnancy estimated at five weeks and three days. However, there was no fetal pulsing and there was no yolk sac yet seen. So now she comes back to the emergency room three days later complaining of continued vaginal bleeding and lower abdominal cramping. However, on physical exam, I found yet another incidental finding of undetermined significance at that time. When I was examining her abdomen, I started off as I do all my abdominal exams. First by inspection, I look for any abdominal scars, swelling, bloating, or pathological bruising, and then I begin to listen with my stethoscope. 
Now, I always start off in the left lower quadrant. Then I go to the left upper quadrant, epigastric region, right upper quadrant, and then down to the right lower quadrant. That way, if I hear any abnormal bowel sounds, I can better postulate any level of, of obstructions in the large bowel or the small bowel, which that was unrevealing. So then the next thing I do is I listen to the renal arteries for any breweries on every single person. I listen to the abdominal aorta, and then I listen to the iliac arteries for any breweries, which I heard a left renal brewery, which radiated down to the left iliac artery. And then I palpated the abdomen, which was really only significant for some very mild suprapubic tenderness. And her pelvic exam was next. It showed a closed cervical os, and she had some mild to moderate amount of dark red blood. She had no cervical motion tenderness, vaginal lacerations, pathological discharge, or any adenaxal masses on biomanual exam. So the next thing I did is I got my intending involved because while this renal brewery was an incidental finding, I knew we had to be more aggressive with our workup and we need to exclude any pathological significance possibly contributing to her threatened abortion. Now, along with her physical exam, she got some repeat labs, uh, an HCG quant, a urine analysis, an ABORH, and a repeat transvaginal ultrasound, all of which showed a stable hemoglobin and hematocrit. She had no abnormal bite cells, schistocytes, helmet cells, or abnormal cells at all on the peripheral smear. Her HCG quant had not increased as much as I would have liked, but it was still progressing and it had almost doubled. She was found to be RH positive with a repeat transvaginal ultrasound showing an intrauterine pregnancy now estimated at five weeks and four days. She still didn't have a fetal pole, but a yolk sac was seen, and now the picture was looking like it was suggestive of a subchorionic hematoma. However, I called the radiologist, and we spoke about some things, and ultimately, he wasn't sure if it was a subchorionic hematoma or hemorrhage or what the picture was actually suggestive of. So a transvaginal ultrasound of unclear uh, significance, basically. Now, this left me and my attending still a little bit puzzled as to what the significance of a renal brewery was. And I tried to order some Doppler ultrasounds of the renal, abdominal aorta, and the iliac arteries, but I couldn't get these studies done at my facility, unfortunately. So I called a local hospital, which is well known for their obstetrical care, and the physician accepted the patient. However, he was unable to provide any great explanation for this brewery that I heard on physical exam. So whether this was an incidental finding was related to her threatened abortion or not, I'm yet to know. But it's possible that she could have had this left renal arterial thrombus, maybe secondary to antiphospholipid syndrome. Now, she didn't give a history of multiple lost miscarriages. Her first pregnancy was completed. Um, she did not make it to term, but she doesn't have any other miscarriages before 10 weeks or any other miscarriages repeatedly after 10 weeks. But antiphospholipid syndrome could certainly cause her to be in a prothrombic state and have maybe a left renal arterial thrombus. Or maybe she had some undiagnosed lupus that was causing abnormalities of her immune system, predisposing her to an immunological rejection and predisposing her to the formation of this renal thrombus. Or Maybe she had another type of hypercoagulable state, such as maybe a factor V Leiden mutation, a protein C, S, or antithrombin defects, or maybe she had fibromuscular dysplasia, but she was ahypertensive, does not, did not have a palpable um, abdominal aorta. Um, she didn't give a history of many migraines in the past, so I don't think fibromuscular dysplasia is the most likely cause. Other things that I have to consider include vasculitis, and looking back and reviewing this case, I could have ordered an ESR or a CRP to see if she had any underlying inflammatory state was occurring, maybe causing her to be hypercoagulable, causing that renal brewery, um, but I'm unsure right now, just things that I could have done to improve this workup. And finally, you know, common things being common um, in talking to the OBGYN, I said, you know, could it just be that there's volume changes in pregnancy and this is just an abnormal variant that's going to be normal? Possibly, you have to consider that, but I can't just say that 
it's normal. Nevertheless, I like this case because it really challenged me to think and grow as a clinician. And once again, it reminds me of the importance of doing a good physical exam in every single patient that I see. So that's everything that we're going to talk about today. But if you have any other ideas of what could have been causing this renal brewery, please leave a comment below. Do you think that it was an incidental finding? Do you think that it was related to her most likely miscarriage? Um, I'm not sure. Let me know what you guys think. But this week was a little bit different. I saw a lot of interesting patients, um, always growing, learning as a clinician. And I'm curious, do you guys want to hear more case studies, more interesting cases um, each week? You can either leave a comment below or just let me know by liking the video. Um, if you're listening on the podcast, you can always send me an email at gray at physicianassistantboards.com. That's G-R-A-Y at physicianassistantboards. Until next time.